Welcome to all of you who are here in the studio audience and watching at home. We're coming to you from the studios of WHYY in Philadelphia. Now this hour is all about money, specifically your money. We're going to touch on the economy and on the banking and financial systems and what's happening right now on Wall Street. But we're mostly here in this town hall style meeting to talk about what's happening on your street. Now, for most Americans, investing in the stock market is just something that we have to do in order to build wealth over a lifetime. And now, most Americans just want to know if the worst is over. Well, in just a couple of minutes, we're going to sit down and have a conversation with the one man who's known as the champion of the small investor, Mr. John C. Bogle. First, though, let's quickly run through how this hour is going to unfold. John Bogle is going to give us his explanation of how we wound up in the worst recession since World War II. He'll give us his opinion on whether we can continue to invest with confidence. And then we're going to open it up for your questions. They'll come from the folks right here in the studio audience, along with a few questions my Money Track co-host Jack Gallagher recorded earlier this week. Now, for those of you who are not already familiar with our special guest, here's a glimpse of John Bogle's extraordinary investing career. Over John Bogle's 58-year career in the financial markets, he's been an advocate on the side of ordinary American investors. He founded Vanguard in 1975 and created a whole new type of investment, the index fund, that made it much simpler and less expensive for Americans to buy stocks and bonds. His advice to investors in hard times is... Keep your determination. If you've thought things through, and know what you want to do and how you want to do them. Don't be shaken by events. Um, keep your character. The money track title of here is John Bogle on stage. Thanks for being here, Jack. By the way, John C. Bogle is also known around this town as Jack. And for this interview, it's Jack. <laughs> now, right. you have written several best selling books about how to invest. Your latest, though, is titled Enough true measures of money, business, and life. What do you mean enough? Well, the book is premised on a wonderful story, which I really ought to tell you. And that is the story of Kurt Vonnegut, the famous uh, author, and Joe Heller, author of Catch-22, and an even, even more successful author. And they went to the, a party given by a billionaire on Shelter Island, and right off uh, Long Island uh -huh. there, uh, kind of lifestyles of the rich and famous kind of place. And uh, they get in there, and, and um, Kurt says, Joe, See that man over there, our host? He's a billionaire, he's a hedge fund manager, and he made more money today on this one day than you have made with every copy of Catch-22 that has ever been sold. And Joe Heller looks over at Kurt Vonnegut and says, that's okay, because I have something he will never have, enough. Enough, okay, I get it. <laughs> it's not now, complicated. Now, so, who, who are you talking to, Jack? Are you talking to bank CEOs? Are you talking to politicians, hedge fund managers, the Federal Reserve, or ordinary Americans who are, you know, have just been living beyond their means? Well, we're, we're actually talking to all of the above, Pam, and that is the money section is about the sins of our financial sector in this economy. Uh, too much overreaching, too much greed, uh, too much lack of awareness of risk, uh, too much financial engineering, making numbers look better than they mm -hmm. are. They are. And then I go from there, from the financial sector to business itself, where any aspect of professional behavior and professional conduct and the ethics that go with the role of a professional have been reduced greatly, if not abandoned in many cases, in favor of business, business, business. The idea is to make a buck in this bottom line society. And we've gotten, I think, too, too much focused on, uh, let's say, the ephemeral, uh, too much focus on charisma and not enough focus on the eternal, and not enough focus on character. So business, general business, in mm -hmm. the U.S. particularly, but all over the world, in part because of greed, human greed, has gotten the message wrong. And then finally, the third section of the book is on us, if you will. Um, us meaning the ordinary investor, the, the ordinary, ordinary investor, working the, person. The ordinary citizen. Right. And that's the part that's the life part, how to live a life, uh, an enjoyable life where you have enough. Now, a good question is, what is enough? And I think that's the question you ask. And I don't know really how to answer that question. I don't think anybody, because it's a very personal thing. It certainly has a lot to do with things other than money. 
Uh, you know, it has to do with the serving the community. It has to do with being a part of a family and raising a family. It has to do with how we handle our colleagues. Uh, it, it has to do with we make a contribution uh, to the welfare of this great land of ours. Uh, and it also does have to do with money and where money comes out because we all want enough so we're not burdens for our children or whatever it might be. Uh, and uh, the best definition I could come up with comes from the, the Roman poet Horace, a couple of centuries back there. And he said, look for the golden mean, somewhere between the agony, uh, the ignominy maybe of a hovel and the envy uh -huh. of a palace over here. And I think most investors are in that admittedly very, very broad range. Couldn't be a better right. time for it. Now, that we right now have the luxury of looking back on all of it, meaning the meltdown, meaning the crisis. Now, in your mind, was it deregulation? Was it too much money flowing into the system? Uh, was it lack of oversight or integrity for that matter? What do you really believe was at the root of this crisis? Well, it, there's an old saying, uh, Pam, that uh, victory has a thousand fathers and defeat is an orphan. Hmm. Uh, this defeat, this great defeat for our capitalistic way of life has a thousand fathers. Uh, just the reverse of what that saying would tell you. Uh, and so there are many, many people to blame. But I put most of the blame on things like too many years of easy credit, too, 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 too much credit made available through our financial system. Uh, number two, a total lack of concern about the quality of that credit. Uh, particularly in the mortgage industry, but all over. Mm. People weren't worried about the quality of the credit. And then we add to that tremendous financial leverage. So if you have a low quality portfolio of securities, let's say mortgages, low, low grade mortgages, they call them ninja loans. Loans that are made to people with no income, no job, and no assets. Uh, that's the ninja. And uh, you, 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 it, they cannot work out well and are not working out well. So we have that added to it. Then we have Wall Street where greed took over, the uh, they plummets. bought these Dot instruments to earn a little bit more money. Recovers. You know, if you Fed can get a 7% yield and a 6% market, you can make an awful spikes. lot of, of additional money fails. because it's not just 1% more, but your margin may have been, let's say, 1% profit margin, right. and 1%. And on billions and billions of well, dollars. Well, when you go from 1% to 2% spread between mm -hmm. borrowing and lending, you double your income. And so you do some financial engineering to get there, and the price of your stock goes up. And of course, you, the executive, sell your stock that you get all those options for, these outrageous amounts of options that were issued, this tremendous dilution uh, to, a, to the corporation's earnings, and you get out and leave Main Street holding the bag. And that's not very attractive. Think about this, you know, if, you, if you're investing uh, and you have a money manager, uh, the money manager takes his or her fee and you get what's left. You are literally at the bottom of the food chain. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, so managers started to look much more at their own personal interests. And what made this possible is something that's really important to understand. And that is, if you go back, say, into the early 1950s or mid 1950s, we had true owner's capitalism. We had an ownership society in which individual investors owned 92% of all the stocks out there. That gradually changed. I call it a pathological mutation in capitalism. Gradually changed to a system in which owners, individual owners, share dropped from 92%, think about this a minute for a minute, to 75, uh, to 25%. 25, wow. 92% right. to 25%. And that different gap was made up by financial institutions, agents who are investing money for other people. Mm, third party. Yeah, third party agents. Uh, the most, the largest of which are mutual fund shareholders and pension fund beneficiaries. And uh, so when you have that, these agents took too much for themselves and we had what we can call agency capitalism or an agency oh. society uh, where at the, at the beginning these agents owned 8% 50 years ago, 8% of all stocks and now they own 75 right. And this has been a gradual change, as you're describing. A little it's been bit over of time. The decades. But in terms of this most recent crisis that's unfolded so violently, um, where does personal responsibility come in? Well, to begin with, you, in this system, you kind of lose personal responsibility. Uh, you, you don't invest other people's money the way you would invest your own. Mm -hmm. uh, Adam Smith wrote about this 230 years ago. Uh, saying just beware because people your agents don't invest your money 
whether it's in the corporation or in the investment company or mutual fund, mm -hmm. the way you'd invest your own. So personal responsibility kind of vanishes, uh, and uh, you put your own interests first, and these agents turned out to be another very unfortunate thing, started speculating with your money and my money, turning over their portfolios at the highest rates ever, even higher than the rates in 1929, far higher, swapping back and forth stocks with guess faster who? Faster and faster and faster. With one seems. another. Right. Just and that's clearly and a zero-sum game. Right. Right? You win or I, and I lose, or I, I win and you lose. No, not true. It's not a zero-sum game. It's a loser's game because we yeah. have that croupier in the middle. That's right. That's the winner. As, known as Wall Street, and right. Wall Street always wins. So when you look at investment returns over time and we see that the market has grown over a very long period of time, at around 9% per year is the sort of accepted return on stocks, if the croupiers are taking two or three percent of that, that means you're earning six or seven percent. Right. And uh, that's but you're, but you're taking just as much risk, and yet you're not getting the the premium back for that. Wrong. You're not getting the value back. Wall Street takes no risk. You put up a hundred percent of the capital, you take a hundred percent of the risk, and you get over an investment lifetime, believe this or not, something like twenty-five percent of the return. 100% of the capital, 100% of the risk, 25% wow. of the return. It's easy to disbelieve that. So do a little test uh, and, and take your little compound interest mm -hmm. table out and compound 8% for 50 years. That's kind of an investment lifetime these days for young people coming into the market. Compound 8% at, uh, at, uh, at for 50 years and see what the dollar grows to. Uh, it's something like $47. And then compound 6% and see what that and grows to. Difference. That's what you get. Right. And it's eleven dollars. Forty seven dollars of return compounded generated and eleven dollars goes to you who put up the money and took the risk. Right. So I, I, the risk I say and, and people I think kind of understand this if you put it in these terms. Just about everybody knows about the magic of compounding mm -hmm. returns. Now but, you ju you just used eight percent, which is interesting because we're not living in a world right now obviously of eight percent. Um, we'll get into investing a, a little bit further into the show, but that is an interesting historical sort of a, a, a percent that we like to use. Well, we should realize that history has nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a historical return. Actually, it's more like nine, but I try and be a little conservative. But as um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge observed a long time before I was born, history is but a lantern over the stern showing you where you have been but not where you're going. So what people don't realize is they do realize the magic of compounding returns, but they fail to realize what I call the tyranny of compounding costs. Right. And that's Same what that time. gap between your return over time right. and the, the market's return comes okay. from. And getting back to Wall Street for just a second, um, some of that excessive, I mean, all of that speculation, all of that excessive risk taking that happened with other people's money, and then right down through the food chain, right down to the to the borrower, who took out the mortgage that you know he or she really couldn't afford. It all helped to create the mess we're in right now. And, and deleveraging is a big process. It's not going to happen overnight. What's a realistic expectation? Well, when you when you get to a totally overleveraged economy, and I could give you some data that says that uh, debt in the economy was once one times our gross national product or gross domestic product and now got up to as high as two and a half times a staggering increase I don't know the exact numbers but that's not a bad indication of the dimension so to get back to where we ought to be in the first place because debt has carrying cost as there I say every credit card holder knows <laughs> as every mortgage holder knows mm -hmm. and anyone who borrows anything knows it has a big cost over time and it, so the, the number has to come down and I, I would say we should probably see as a as a very rough guess and nobody knows uh, that maybe by uh, the middle of the year 2010 mm -hmm. this economy will have bottomed out and will start to come back. Some of the debt will be paid down. It will take longer than that to pay it all down and maybe we'll be moving forward again. Well, one of the consequences of having enjoyed the party is now the payback, which unfortunately includes higher unemployment rates and it's a huge concern for the entire economy. But at the same time, those tiny green shoots of hope are showing up. The stock market's not quite as despondent as it was a few months ago. And consumer sentiment's actually been surprisingly upbeat just recently. So 
in the end, it's really investing has more to do with confidence than anything else, doesn't it? Well, it has to do with confidence, but I think a good rule for everybody observed is uh, the stock market is a poor place to expect hope to bail you out <laughs> because hope does not spring eternal in the stock market. So um, basically, the stock market is not even the right way to look at what you are doing as an investor. Now, I've made the distinction many times. I think you know this. And when people say, what should I do? I said, first thing you have to do is answer this one simple question for me. You have to tell me whether you are an investor or whether you are a speculator. What's the difference between an investment investor and a speculator? Well, a speculator, that's the easy one, uh, is buying and selling stocks, trading with somebody else, hoping to outsmart this person day after day after day. So in every speculation, there's a winner and a loser. We won't go through the croupier winning again. <laughs> We've had enough of that. But it's uh, betting on stock prices, betting on the short term, uh, betting on perception rather than reality, betting on expectations, all of that relates to speculation. Yeah, because you're betting, betting, betting. What is betting? What is, what is investing? Mm -hmm. Investing is buying and holding stocks for the long term, not a stock. Let me be very clear on that. Because in this day and age, buying and holding a stock is, I believe, more risky than it has ever been in human history. One single stock versus. And the reason is we have, first, this financial crisis, which is going to put a lot of people out of business. Number two, we have global competition for the first time. Mm -hmm. And powerful companies in the United States aren't going to be able to make it when a powerful competitor arises in Europe or in China or in India or in Japan, whatever it might be. And number three, we have this information age revolution, the revolution in technology, and a big, smart, successful technology company may open the doors, let's say today, and when they close the doors tonight, they're out of business. Somebody has got a better idea. So for those three reasons, uh, you know, the financial crisis, uh, global competition, and the rapid change in technology and innovation, uh, it's not safe to hold a stock. So what do you do if you can't hold a stock? What you do is hold all stocks by, I would argue, American business, every single company in America, and hold it in terms of how big or small it is in the market. You'd have more Microsoft and more General Electric uh, than you would have some little, uh, what we call over-the-counter, an unlisted company that, that doesn't even trade. So place your bets where the large mm -hmm. size is, is I think the best thing to do, because that will give you the same ownership as we all have collectively. In other words, we all own more Microsoft as a group uh, than anybody else, or Exxon is, the, is now the biggest company uh, in America. And we, uh, since the world owes more of that, we just want to own our fair share, say 4% of our portfolio in their case. So own the market portfolio, own American business, and hold it forever. Diversification wins all battles. Yep. Don't bet on one horse, bet on the whole race. Right. Now, getting back around to confidence. Actually, stay out of the racetrack. Just stay away from the race track altogether. <laughs> okay. Uh, but confidence, how important is confidence to the overall market at a, at a time like this? Well, you know, confidence is, is a, has many, many aspects, but let me, let me give you a few. Uh, one, uh, the one reason our economy is uh, suffering now is that people do not have the wherewithal to spend. Uh, they've lost their jobs. They're worried about losing jobs. They've lost a lot in their 401k mm -hmm. or their investments if they were overwhelmingly invested in equities, which we can talk about later on. It's not, not the best of ideas. We need some kind of balance there. Mm -hmm. And But spending is also not just wherewithal, but the confidence to spend. And that confidence has been badly shaken. Mm -hmm. So confidence uh, basically yields, a lack of confidence yields further loss in confidence right. because it slows the economy down and builds the circle of those who are, who are worried about the future. So we have to restore confidence. That's okay. not going to be easy. Uh, but uh, my own personal view is that uh, with good leadership in Washington, and I think our president is providing good leadership, uh, I'm not so sure about the Congress. They seem to be doing some very funny <laughs> things to me. And I don't think they should be running the accounting profession, for one thing. But that's another story. But uh, I, th I think we need to kind of set up a program which the administration is desperately trying to do under the most extreme circumstances we've ever faced, yeah. a program that will be stabilized, uh, that will not change from day to day. People will know what to rely on uh, and make their decisions based on, you know, a pretty sound plan. Right. That's going to be 
long in duration and hard to get through this mess. I'm convinced we will get through it, but not without strong leadership. I can see where that would go a long way for confidence. Now, what about trust? These were supposed to be the smartest guys on Wall Street, and they took excessive risks with other people's money, as you point out. Quotes. Some of these structured investments were nothing more than, especially the credit swaps, nothing more than side bets, glorified side bets. And that didn't work out. So now the divide between Wall Street and my street seems wider than ever. What's it going to take to restore trust in the system? Well, first, just think about what you just said, and that is, here's and you're correct, by the way. Uh, the problems were created by Wall Street, and the results are being borne by Main Street. So if people don't have trust, I think they are very good judges of character. I do not like what I see in Wall Street. Uh, I do not like the short-term focus. I do not like the grotesquely excessive compensation. Uh, and those things are very difficult to fix. We have compensation consultants out there. It doesn't matter if we say you can't have another nickel. Somebody will find the nickel for somebody mm. somewhere, I'm sure. Uh, so um, it, it's basically uh, trying to, I mean, my, my big hope for this country, to just go a little bit beyond your question, is that uh, the young generation that's coming along is a lot stronger than the generations that have gone before them. That's our big hope, and that will take a little time to happen. But to rebuild trust and confidence is not going to be an easy matter. Well, I've heard you say, and I've read, and I love this expression, you like to say that Wall Street blew itself up by its own dynamite. Now, that's actually a statement I stole, stole from one William Shakespeare. Uh, and uh, <laughs> he said, blown up by its own petard, hoist by its own petard. And that means blown up by your own dynamite. And the problem with Wall Street is, I frankly, if they have to blow themselves up with their own dynamite, that suits me just fine. <laughs> but, I, but I don't like a lot of innocent victims out there that did nothing to create this mess and are paying an extreme uh, financial and personal price. It is not fair and it is not right. And it is not just. But, you know, Ben Stein, who's pretty well known for his opinions on all things economic, <laughs> wanted to add to your remarks about Wall Street blowing itself up. Take a listen to this. Nobody would care if they blew themselves up with their own dynamite. They blew up the rest of us with their dynamite. They blew up the rest of us with the dynamite that they were using, playing with, and for which we were paying them stupendous sums of money. Confidence in the financial system is completely shot. Uh, it's shot at every level. What we've learned is that Wall Street took huge, enormous, stupendous amounts of money out of the savings of Americans. Gigantic, unbelievable amounts, amounts so large that it staggers the imagination. And for this, they supposedly invested wisely. They didn't do that. It turns out that was a big supposedly. And second, they supposedly distributed risk, which is a phrase that uh, some smart PR person invented to mean that they uh, lowered risk for the ordinary investor. They didn't do that. They greatly concentrated risk and made the system far more dangerous. That's Ben. Now, you know, ask people in any city or town across America, and a lot of them are going to tell you that this crisis and the government's response to it are total game changers. In other words, that everything going forward will be different now, and that the old rules of capitalism are not going to apply. Do you agree? Well, I agree with uh, that in terms of the economic system, that we need new rules. We need to reform capitalism. And my own personal view is that what went wrong in this agency system I've described, and you'll recall it was an ownership society that is gone and is never going to return, to an agency society that's not serving the principals that it's supposed to serve, those fund shareholders, for example, to a new what I call fiduciary society. And that is a federal requirement. And I'm not a big believer in regulation, but I don't see any other way to do this. A federal requirement that more money managers observe traditional standards of fiduciary duty, a federal fiduciary standard for money managers, which says what? Simply put, it says, put the clients first. Don't charge those excessive fees. Participate in corporate governance and force those corporations out there to operate in the interest of their shareholders. Focus on the long term, we'll call that investing, and not on the short term, we'll call that speculation. Got it. And don't let f big financial conglomerates come in here and own your management company because those financial conglomerates which own two-thirds of the mutual fund management companies you do you think Pam that those financial conglomerates buy a mutual fund company for a billion dollars 
to earn a return on the capital of the mutual fund shareholders. I don't think they know who I am. <laughs> uh, or to re earn a return on their own capital. Right. But that whole different set of stockholders. And that gets to, you can see this coming very clearly here. Here are the mutual fund shareholders. They're in the rumble seat, if anybody remembers that phrase. <laughs> Look, I do. Uh, or should they serve the shareholders of the management company, this big right. conglomerate? And I think Matthew and Luke put it pretty well. No man can serve two masters. And so we've got to not allow these financial conglomerates right. to get into this money management field. And they could not do so if the rule was, you, you're fine, Bella, but you right. can't serve two masters. There has to be you rules. Gotta, you have to choose. There have to be. All right, now we've gotten a sense of what's happened on Wall Street. Let's now turn our attention to your street. Jack, you point out in the book that we, meaning ordinary investors, really do need to understand that that you just pointed out, the difference between investing and speculating, the huge difference. And as I listen, I mean, it sounds pretty basic, but it kind of turns out that the payoff, the biggest payoff, always seems to be when it comes to investing, sticking to the basics. So I guess the question on the minds of those who are staring at their 401k statements right now is, where do we go from here? Well, you know, to me, there's a wonderful uh, saying out there that says, investing is simple, but it is not easy. And uh, it's, it's a, you know, it sounds like a little twist of words, but it's actually much more than that. What is simple about investing is if you believe what I believe, uh, and that is owning not a stock, but the stock market and holding it forever. And apply that only to your stock position now. Um, that's the way you run your stock portfolio, my opinion. It's called index fund, been around. Actually, I started the first one in 1975, and it's worked just the way it should. It beats most of the managers most mm -hmm. of the time. Can't fail to do that because of its low cost. But bef even before you get to how you want to handle your stock portfolio, the first thing and the unchanging rule, and the simple rule, is think about asset allocation. How much in stocks for growth, with a lot of risk that comes with it, how much in bonds with income, and a fair amount of safety that comes with them. And uh, balance off those things. And I use this rule, I've used it for, I don't know, 25, 35 years, certainly as long as I can remember. How much in stocks, how much in bonds. And my simple rule, rule of thumb really, just to begin to think about it, Mm -hmm. is have your bond position equal your age. Now, it must have occurred to you as I'm saying that, that for someone who is 111 years old, um, <laughs> that I'm feeling not badly about the recent decline in the market because I was, uh, I was not 111% in bonds. No, I can't do that. Uh, but uh, ever since the beginning of the 90s when the stock market was ridiculously high, uh, uh, at that point I was about 65% in bonds, roughly my age then, and now, these years later, I'm, I guess, approximately 77 or 8 or maybe 80% in bonds mm -hmm. and 20% in stocks. But so that asset allocation that you're pointing out is so important. It is so essential and so overlooked. It's how much to put in real estate, how much to put in stocks, how much to put in bonds, and when. Well, the when is not life. much of a problem. I mean, you should be doing that at all times because yeah. think about this for a minute. Just think about what happens. And I, say, I regret to say that it's personally affecting me. Uh, but what happens as you get older? Uh, you have less time to recoup your mistakes. You have more money at stake, and therefore you want to be more careful. You want to think as you get toward retirement, and I'm not suggesting that I'm getting anywhere near toward retirement because I don't expect to retire. Uh, but as you get toward retirement, you're going to think about an investment that produces income and its relative security as compared to an investment that produces mm -hmm. capital growth and its tremendous fluctuations between the ups and the downs. And finally, as you get older, as compared to when you're young, I think you get a little bit more nervous when the market goes through a phase like it's going through now, where you have never had, I'll just give you one more number uh, to show you how speculative this market is. In the last 50 years, there were 28 years, well over half, in which the market never moved once in any single day by 3%. Mm, in, in a day. Yeah. In the last six months, there have been 58 3% mm -hmm. moves wow. from zero to 58. And that is rank speculation, and of course, wow. it adds, it ends badly. Tremendous volatility, yeah. absolutely. I've been around the industry, in and around the industry, for about 30 years. Now, 
I have always thought of you, and I think that most people do, as a buy and hold kind of guy. And maybe even the poster child for investing in a diversified way with the proper asset allocation for the long haul. I think a lot of people want to ask you, what do you mean when you talk about long-term investing? I mean, exactly, in years. I'm talking about Warren Buffett's favorite holding period, forever. Now think about that. And let's say, to put a number on it, how about 50 years? And uh, now, for somebody my age, I'm not sure I have 50 years left, but who knows, really? Uh, and uh, as you get older, you know, that time period obviously shortens. But it should be a life, investing is a lifetime affair. And it's doing simple things, owning a diversified stock portfolio, owning a diversified bond portfolio, deciding, I think correctly, that you have a little more in the latter and a less in the former as the years roll on, getting costs out of the system. Keep mm -hmm. the croupiers at bay if it takes a double-barreled shotgun to do so. If you have to go into the gambling casino, once you've made your bets, get out and never go back again, is the way I would look at it. Mm -hmm. So uh, these things are all pretty simple. Why it's not easy to complete that phrase is because we are our own worst enemies. We are greedy. We believe that the past performance of a mutual fund or even a stock is going to tell you how it will do in the future. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, so we look back uh, and buy the wrong funds at the wrong time. We also love to buy stocks when the market is at an all-time high, apparently thinking that the market will go up forever. And we love to sell stocks when the market goes down, thinking that the market will go down forever. It's so much about emotions and, yeah. and behavior. Um, and, and it's interesting when you think about the basics, because what you're saying, if you're really thinking about it, is, is quite simple. In essence, but not easy. But, but not easy to do. We can't get out of our own way when it comes to investing. All right, now the toughest question of the evening for you. Is buy and hold dead or alive going forward? Well, it's alive forever. I mean, it's so funny. You read about in the paper, they have these, you know, shorthanded headlines. And the people that say, what about buy and hold are going to tell you, well, the stock market has done nothing for 10 years, which is actually nothing for about 13 years, and that's true. Uh, but I'm not talking about buying and holding the stock market. I'm talking about buying and holding a balanced portfolio allocated between stocks and bonds, and that is eternal. Uh, and what people, th this has been a little bit unusual, a very unusual period, and that is it's not just that in the, this decade, this first decade of the new millennium, that stocks are down probably an average of maybe 2 or 3% a year. I don't know the exact number, but that will be close. But in the previous two decades, stocks were going up at 17% a year. Well, I got used to that. And we, well, we got used <laughs> to that, but, but think about where the 17% came from. Right. It came not because American business was generating larger and larger returns. It's because investors, in their unwisdom, were paying more and more for each dollar of earnings. Now, just to give you one more little mathematical number, if I may, if the price earnings multiple, the amount you pay uh, for a dollar of earnings, goes from $10 to $20, that's over a decade, that's 7% a year out of your return. So the real return on stocks was 10 and you thought it was 17. In the next decade, unprecedented in American history, that price earnings multiple went from $20 to $40. Mm. It doubled again. Another 7% return on top of a business return of about 8 or 9%. That not only cannot happen again, unless you're crazy enough to pay $80, which is what's required the next time for right. a dollar, the next decade right. for a dollar stock. Not only cannot happen, but you have to have what we call reversion to the mean. Stocks have to come back down Eventually, to Earth. it's kind of like the laws of physics when it comes to investing. Exactly. What goes up must come down right. in, this, in this speculative sense. American business doesn't need to go up and down. Sometimes it will, mm -hmm. but it, it's mainly the stock market. And that's why I've often said what happens in these markets and all their speculative flavor and all this growth that was created and created what I call phantom wealth. That wasn't real wealth we had in the, at the, as this decade began. It was wealth that was way overstated because of the valuations people right. put on stocks. Paper, paper. So, so when we watch the stock market, as I've said in my, one of my previous books, it turns out, think about this for a minute, with all the stuff we see on television and, and uh, in the paper every day and prices are up and this is down and he's in and she's out and so on down the line, it turns out and companies earn this or that and nobody knows really where the earnings come from 
that the stock market is a giant distraction to the business of investing. Of investing, yep. Because exactly. investing is corporations earning a return on their capital, paying dividends, and taking what's left to create earnings growth over time. And that's what is simple. Great. Now, you know, you would think that the people who have access to the highly sophisticated, the most highly sophisticated investing strategies, I mean, far too complex for the average person to comprehend, you would think that those strategies would beat the buy and hold description that you're describing by a long shot. I'm not, I, I, would, so. I would not think that. <laughs> I've been around too long. First, you have to understand something that's very simple, and that is if you're trading in, say, a, I don't know, a collateralized mortgage obligation, say something like that, and you're going short, as one of the hedge fund managers did and made himself, I think, $3 billion in Pretty a single wealthy. year. It's a, li it's a living. It's a living. <laughs> and uh, someone else was on the other side of that trade. He was short those collateralized obligations. Right. Somebody else was long. So if he made $20, $20 billion for his clients, somebody lost $20 billion for his or her clients. There's no way around the fact that the market is a closed system. And when you read in the paper, think about this for a minute. Money poured into technology stocks and out of bank stocks today. Poured into technology stocks means everybody bought technology stocks and nobody sold them. I mean, really, think about that. And then everybody sold bank stocks, but nobody bought them. Well, how did they sell them then? The market is essentially a closed system, and most of what people think about and read about and look at in the news and the headlines is simply not worth yeah, it's a really to. difficult perspective. That's that the way. giant distraction I was right. talking about. I can understand that. Now we're ready to take some of your questions. Let's get started right here in the studio. You've An talked about member, stocks, Audrey, and Lucy I was Brown. wondering, my 401k is worth about half of what it was a year ago, and you've talked about confidence. Now I know you can't tell us when the market is going to recover, but should I still continue to contribute to my 401k plan? The answer to that question is absolutely. Uh, just think about it this way. Uh, you're out buying groceries, and all of a sudden, the price of milk or eggs or steak is cut in half. Is that a good thing for you or a bad thing? It's a good thing. These values are, they, 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 the stock market may go lower. We just don't know that. But you have to continue investing when you're buying stocks at roughly half of the fundamental value that you, that you were buying them at, at the high. But your emotions, your, it's a good example, your emotions are leading you the wrong way. The time for you to get, get scared and get out was when you were so happy and optimistic when your 401k account had its previous <laughs> double the value. Truth, yeah. So the, the, your emotions betray you. So I, I'm not trying to tell you, be very clear on this, that uh, this is the time to jump into the stock market. Uh, but it is time, always time, to keep your plan going. And eventually, you're going to want to add a little bonds to that. I would, for someone that's relatively young, always have a bond position, personally speaking, just because having a little, what can we say, anchor to windward maybe, a little dry powder, uh, can help keep you from making mistakes that you shouldn't otherwise make. So uh, you might want to think about it, I'm not in any rush, but gradually having a little bond position, I'm guessing your age here, like that guy down at the Atlantic City boardwalk, and uh, yeah, <laughs> you should probably have, I don't know, 10 or 15% in bonds, I don't know exactly, but. But, but think about a little bit of safety there in, in an appropriate way. Not, don't, don't do anything, ever do anything in a hurry in the stock market. Good. Let's take another question now, this time from my co-host, Jack Gallagher, who was outside, out and about in Philadelphia. We're now in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. We're at the Granite Farms Estates. It's a life care community. I'm with one of the residents, Al Hahn, and Al has a question regarding folks of his generation. In the current economy, retirees living on a fixed income need to go to safer investments. What do you recommend as a safer investment? The safety you find is in bonds, but we now have a very complicated bond situation where there's been such heavy bidding, often from abroad, for U.S. Treasuries. The yield on U.S. Treasury bonds, which is where you want to be from a credit standpoint, the, the full faith and credit of the United States of America is still good, certainly the best credit in the world, no matter how, whether you argue it's good or not, it's the best in the world. And corporate bonds in the U.S., high-quality investment-grade corporate bonds, uh, are yielding much more, but they have that default risk. Right now, that's spread. We have two bond markets. The Treasury bond market, let's call that a 3% yield, 
and the corporate bond market, let's call it a 6.5% yield, very roughly illustrate the point. So I would not limit myself to treasuries. I happen to believe that this will maybe uh, not surprise anybody, but a bond index fund that includes the entire U.S. bond market, which is part treasuries and part corporates, and part government-backed, Ginny May, we call them, are those, and mortgage-backed. Uh, are those corporates considered, um, you know, the AAA, the tri uh, well, the highest very, grade? Yeah, very few AAA, but there are quite a few AA, mm -hmm. and a very diversified portfolio where you own maybe 500 bonds, 300 mm -hmm. bonds, none, none of which are over 1%. Again, so portfolio. even though there might be a concern that down the road interest rates may have to go up at some point, um, now they're, you're they're, not really concerned about owning a bond fund that's, you, you don't want to go out too far. No, in, well, you, you can make your choice. Uh, right. and the bond funds are either short-term bonds, mm -hmm. intermediate-term bonds, mm -hmm. or long-term bonds. Yeah. And I favor some mix of short and intermediate. I don't like the long risk. But, uh, so short and intermediate, yeah. a nice diversified and, and you can mix. buy a mutual fund with mm -hmm. that kind of a portfolio. Mm -hmm. Just make sure it doesn't the cost costs. much. The costs, with, 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 exactly. Uh, with bond yields in these ranges, if the mutual fund manager is taking a percentage out of your yield of 4%, yeah. Yeah. that means the manager is getting 25% right. and you're getting 75. It's math Go we just don't do. Go somewhere where you get 100 exactly. or 95. It, you know, it's just exactly. math we never do. A lot of times it's because the fees are buried. But let's take another question right now. Yeah, can I, I just make one more little amplifier? Sure. Because uh, it's, it's a very important thing to think about. And, and this is another reason that the choice among bonds is difficult. We actually have in the United States the ultimate inflation hedge. And it's pretty close to perfect. And that is we have U.S. Treasury bonds. You can buy short, intermediate, or long ones that are hedged against inflation. And so if the inflation rate goes up, your interest mm -hmm. rate on those bonds, these inflation mm -hmm. protection bonds, right. will go up too. That is the ultimate protection. Ah, alas, there's a catch. There's always a catch mm -hmm. to everything. Mm -hmm. And that is because of that protection, those inflation hedge bonds have been bid up to the point where it 10-year bond those are high. is right. about 1.5% yield, right. not much more than that. Right. So if inflation is 1.5, you're getting 3%. Right. Now, if inflation explodes and you get, say, 6% inflation, right. well, you'll add 6 to that 1.5, no question about that, and you'll get 7.5. But you start off at a pretty modest Two, level. Yeah, right, I can understand that. So stick with the shorter and the more intermediate. Now, let's take another question right now from Jack Gallagher. This time, it's from a high school student who's asking you about trust. I'm with Maribel Moreno. Maribel is a high school student. What year? 10th grade. A sophomore in high school, and she has a question concerning her age group. Well, I'm really concerned about the future. With everything that's going on, can we ever trust Wall Street again? Leah, the answer to that is, of course we can trust Wall Street again, but not the Wall Street we know today. People have lost their trust in Wall Street, and they are going to demand these individual human beings who have been so badly hurt by uh, the behavior of Wall Street will demand a better Wall Street. They will demand to refer to a previous conversation, a previous subject we touched on. I love they will this demand answer. That, wa <laughs> that, that Wall Street behave as fiduciaries for your money uh, and will invest uh, your money the way you would invest it yourself and not the way they would do it with speculative risk. So trust can be restored, but you know there's an old saying, and it could never be more true than where we find ourselves right here, uh, right here this evening. Uh, right here in the studio, and that is trust is an awful lot easier to destroy than it is to create. Creating or restoring trust is a long-range proposition, mm. and Wall Street was able to destroy it in a matter really of months from the middle of 2007 to, say, the September of 2008. It took a year and a quarter for that trust to be destroyed. I really, really appreciate your answer there. Let's take another question from right here in the studio now. Obviously, I'm a military member, and I currently contribute to my thrift savings plan. I was just wondering if there's any investments that I just, should just stay away from. Now, the thrift savings plan, is, for people who don't know, is just like a 401k for all uh, federal employees and service members. Well, first of all, I think I would be totally derelict in my duty if I didn't say thank you for your service to our country. Uh, we really depend on people like you, and I, I thank you really from the bottom of my heart for, for that. To get to your question, uh, I really like the thrift saving plan. I've been familiar with it for a long time. I knew some of the executives down there. It's run at an even lower price than Vanguard has run, the ultimate accolade. <laughs> uh, and uh, I mean, I like that because I like competition. And uh, oh, make a note on their, <laughs> their prime offering is an index fund, stock index fund. And uh, they, they do offer a bond option. So yes, 
that, that's the right way to go. I mean, I would not, they got into, I think, real estate, you'd remember this, and you know, real estate funds a few years ago. I'm not just so keen on real estate, and of course, this year, real estate has blown up. So stick down the center. Uh, stick with the stock index fund, stick with the bond index fund, balance them in the way that I've kind of suggested. I, and don't be tempted by, you know, the grass is not always greener on the other side of the fence. Uh, in this case, the ground is, the grass is pretty terrible on the other side of the fence. So stay on the good side of the fence, Christine. And again, diversification wins all mm -hmm. battles. So let's go back to Jack. He's at a diner in Media, Pennsylvania. Pam and John, I'm now with Steve Kurtz, and we are at the Court Diner in Media, Pennsylvania. And Steve has a question that a lot of people are wondering about. Steve? How is it that the heads of these banks that took risks with other people's money have not been penalized? They get to keep their bonuses. How can that be? First of all, it's not a very attractive situation. And I have the same kind of outrage that I think Steve shares, or I share Steve's outrage. But in our system, you know, before, before you can take property away from somebody, uh, they really have to commit a crime or have gotten the, the, the property by illicit or illegal mm -hmm. uh, means. I mean, for example, stealing. Uh, and uh, th these kinds of white-collar crimes, let's call them, are deeply disturbing, but there is no criminal behavior that we know of. Now, I'm not talking about Mr. Bernard Madoff and uh, I guess Mr. Stanford and the half a dozen other Ponzi-type people who have come along the street here, but I'm talking about these executives who will argue, you know, they had to do a lot of, I mean, and this is what makes the system really a problem. Well, we had to do a lot of leverage in our bank. We had to buy, buy these lower quality uh, investments because everybody else was doing it, and we had to keep up with them, or Wall Street would say, look, you're not running your bank well enough, so there's a lot of pressure to make earnings grow even beyond expectations. And that gets to a point which I'd like to make uh, Pam, which is the whole ethics of our society and the ethics of our uh, business community have really gone quite to seed here. And the way I like to express it is, and the older, the older people in the audience will understand this, you know, it wasn't very many years ago when the standard of conduct, there were some things one simply did not do. You just don't do that, that's all. You don't need a rule to tell you. And that changed to, if everybody else is doing it, I can do it too. And I call that the difference between moral absolutism over here and moral relativism over here, and I don't like it. Uh, there are some things that are not negotiable. There is not just a nation of gray or a world of gray, there is black and there is white, and we darn well better figure out what the difference is. Hi, good evening, Jack. I have a question about the national debt. I'm planning to start a family soon, and I'm really concerned about their future and the impact of the debt on it. What, um, what's going to happen with the debt in regards to the value of the dollar? And also, are my kids and their kids going to end up footing the bill for it? That's, of course, a very profound and, and very good question, which I worry about, too, because I have six children and 12 grandchildren. And uh, who's going to pay off all this debt? Mm. Uh, what's going to happen to the value of the dollar? And the answers to those questions are by no means self-evident. You know, we're borrowing at levels, the federal government is borrowing or guaranteeing at levels that are beyond any remote connection with anything we've ever done before. And uh, so what we have to do is try and have a plan to keep those deficits under control, and that will mean, you know, there are only two ways, this is a, the financial system of the U.S. Treasury is pretty simple. There are two ways to work on a, an ex, uh, a budget deficit, and one is to raise revenues and the other is to reduce expenses. This is not complicated. It's simple, but it's not easy, I guess I could say again, uh, because when you think about it, it's going to be very difficult to raise taxes. I think that the administration's honestly going in the right direction about raising taxes on the, the better off among us, the top 5%. I think that's appropriate. Uh, and uh, they're going to have to really be focused very heavily on trying to cut back on government expenditures at a time when it is awesomely difficult to do so. Just think about this for a minute. When we have... You, know, you can't just not give our troops in Afghanistan and for a while at least Iraq, uh, send them over there without weapons and, and protection. Uh, we have to do something about our educational system. That's a long-term uh, problem, but you know, the longer you wait to get working on it, uh, the U.S. is going to fall way behind unless we work on that system. Our health care system has a lot of room for improvement, and I think we can generate some savings there. But this, it's a tough, long job, and we have to hope 
that we'll be able to grow our way out of some of the problems that, that have just been raised. Uh, but uh, that's not going to be easy. It's not going to happen overnight. But with a little fiscal discipline and a little intelligent planning uh, and uh, a good leadership uh, and a terrific generation coming along, I don't think it's impossible. I like the optimism. Hello, Mr. Bogle. Uh, I'm divorced and I've been using the services of a financial planner. Uh, but in the light of what's happened recently with the Madoff and the Stanford disasters, I wanted to know if I should still depend on my financial planner or can I do it myself? That is a great question right now. Not only that, how do you work with a financial advisor? Do you turn your money over to that advisor? Uh, what's the best way to have a relationship with a financial advisor? Well, I, I guess I'm tempted to quote uh, former President Clinton says it all depends on what the meaning of it is. <laughs> uh, can you do it yourself? Uh, and the answer is yes, you can. Uh, if the it is a simple program, an asset allocation program diversified between stocks and bonds that you forget, you put your money in regularly, uh, you, you make sure it's very low cost and keep putting your money in. Don't peak is another reason. You don't need to look at that darn thing every day or every time that ghastly statement comes in, uh, at least ghastly at the moment, uh, and just hang in there. And I should say much more than parenthetically, that's what I've been doing since 1951. In July of 1951, my first job with Wellington Management Company, uh, I was making $250 a month and $37.50 went into my defined contribution uh, pension plan there. And I've been doing it ever since then, 57 years. And you would be um, in, in the Wellington and Vanguard funds, stocks the beginning, bonds the end, you would be amazed how much money is in that plan. I, I, I break my own rule once in a while. There's so much money in there that I peek every once in a while. <laughs> okay, uh, well, maybe maybe another way to put so, it, too, is to trust but verify, maybe, uh, if you're working with a financial advisor. But if you're trying to beat the system, which I don't recommend, and you want to get into more exotic instruments, what we call alternative investments, yeah. maybe a little hedge fund here, some commodities there, uh, trying to pick the latest top manager, uh, you can't do that by yourself. Uh, the big caveat here is I'm not sure there's an advisor that can do that with success. Uh, we actually had data done by some professors up at Harvard that show that investment advisors uh, do a little bit worse than investors operating on their own. And uh, that's before we take into account that the advisor takes usually something like 1% a year from your account. Right. So if you're comfortable doing that, if you're com comfortable going the simple way, uh, I, I think you can do it yourself. All right. Well, listen, thank you so much, everybody, for your questions. They were all really on point. Now let's review what we've learned today. We do this at the end of every Money Track episode. First, we learned that what got us into this mess was a lack of oversight and integrity that led to excessive risk taking, which we are now all paying for. Number two, we learned that confidence and trust are essential elements in order for the financial markets to work. And finally, we learned from Jack Bogle that asset allocation is the key to successful investing. Buy and hold may be alive and well, but asset allocation, diversification are key. And be very mindful of the costs associated with investing. Fees matter. Jack Good Bogle. Summary. <laughs> thank you. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. And one more thing. Booyah! Booyah. <laughs> <laughs>